Hello, leaders of the world. Welcome to Spread Love in Organizations, a podcast for purpose-driven healthcare leaders striving to make life better around the world by leading their teams with genuine care, servant leadership, and love. I'm Naji, your host for this episode, joined today by Dr. Chirag Upadhaya, Clinical Associate Professor of Neurosurgery and Chief Transformation and Business Strategy Officer. Chirag completed neurosurgical residency at the University of Michigan, Complex and Minimally Invasive Spine Fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco, and research fellowships at the Howard Hughes Medical Institutes, National Institutes of Health, and the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, resulting in a master's in science from the University of Michigan. He recently completed his MBA from MIT Sloan, where we met as classmates and had fun negotiating a car in one of our classes. Chirag is a member of the executive committee for the AANS, CNS, Spine and Peripheral Nerve section, as well as a member of several associations. He has been awarded the Scoliosis Research Society Edgar Dawson Traveling Fellowship and AANS, CNS, Spine and Peripheral Nerve Outcomes Committee Award. Chirag was also elected to the editorial board of the Journal of Neurosurgery, Spine, in 2021. And it is such an honor and pleasure to have you with me today. Oh, thanks, Naji. That's a very uh, humbling uh, introduction. Well, every time we chatted about this podcast and this episode, you kept telling me with such humility that you have nothing interesting to tell. And I know you have a ton. So why don't we start with your personal story? Can you tell us a little bit more what got you to where you are today? Yeah. So I'm the the son of uh, immigrants uh, from India. Um, they they came here. My father came here in the late 1960s, um, actually because he wanted to to be a physician. So he did his medical education in India and then came to the United States for a residency um, and then decided to stay here. Um, and, uh, that experience, I think transfers a lot to me, uh, you know, understanding what my father and my mother went through as they made that transition from India to the United States and the drive and determination that he had, and my mom had about wanting to take care of patients really. And so that served as a very early inspiration in terms of just work ethic but also in terms of what I wanted to do with my life. And so I knew early on I wanted to become um, a physician. Um, that was just a, a core part of who I was as I was growing up. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> that was the that was the part. I didn't know what part. My dad is an OB, uh, GYN. And so I, I saw a lot of or heard about a lot of things that he did. Um, so surgery was somewhat interesting to me at the time, but I really just didn't know. Um, but I put my head down, worked, went to college and and then went to med school. And as I went through medical school, I really enjoyed um, surgery. I loved just working with my hands. I loved the clinical aspects of uh, leading a team, right? To, to be able to operate successfully and safely, you have to be able to help everybody around you perform at a certain level, right? Um, so that the patient is taken care of really well. And that really attracted me. There was something about that that just um, connected. Um, and so I pursued surgical training and ultimately um, neurosurgical training, um, and then ultimately spine, as you as you already outlined. Um, the other aspect though that I wanted to explore was you know, inquiry. I wanted to understand, okay, how can you not only make an impact on our patients today, but how do you start impacting patients um, uh, in terms of future, right? Extend yourself, scale yourself up as a uh, individual and research is one avenue. And I looked at basic science, but I realized that basic science, uh, which was the Howard Hughes um, NIH program, um, wasn't, didn't connect with me. Um, and that's where the clinical research came in uh, with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Fellowship. And then the MBA actually was a way to sort of understand how to connect the dots when it comes to clinical outcomes research, but how do you actually implement that, right, within large health systems, right, within organizations? It's uh, it's actually a, something I'm seeing more and more of now that you and I have finished the program that there's a disconnect between understanding the data and understanding how to actually operationalize the data, implement it for best practices. And so that you know, brought me back to academics um, here at UNC as a way of being able to function within a large health system and work with partners and 
neurosurgery, but within the larger health system as well. Thanks for sharing uh, part of your story with us. Uh, and I know as we were just telling you, are we connecting? You told me you might be called for the operating room uh, as we're recording. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts actually about this. You talked about it, about this readiness, really constant readiness to deliver in high stress environment, not only you, but also the team around you. How, how do you do that? Yeah, so it's it. it... I learned this from my faculty at the University of Michigan. Um, and there's a few factors that I've always taken with me, right? So the first is you you have to really be good at your job, right? It, yourself, right? Uh, you always have to put the patient first. Um, and then the other thing that I've learned in that I, I understood it from my faculty in terms of the training, and and I jokingly say, as I grew up in in, in medicine, um, but it was emphasized in everything we learned at MIT, which is you have to create um, a safe space for folks, right? Um, and you also have to um, empower folks, right? So let me give you a small example. Um, every time I do an operation, one of the things that I, when you're doing a spine surgery, for example, is you have to check and make sure you're operating on the right level, right? Are you operating on what level of the spine? Um, and the spine has a lot of vertebra. And so if you're in a rush, it's easy to get off one level. Um, and that is something that obviously you don't want to do, right? You want to operate on the level where the patient has the pathology. And so when I check the level with an x-ray, I stop and ask everybody around the room before I say anything, look at the films, double check if that level matches the level that we thought we were going to do from the initial timeout consent process and so forth. And I do that for a couple of reasons. One is I want to make sure that everybody's engaged. Everybody's part of the team. The second thing is I want to convey to everybody that if you see something that you feel that we're at the wrong level, speak up, say something, right? Um, I want you to say something, right? If I'm driving it completely all the time, then folks are going to be passive part of the process. And I think you can't get the best out of everybody when they're passive in the process versus if you actively engage them in the process. And I think that it makes a huge impact on patient care. And I gave an operative example, but I think the same is, is very true in the outpatient realm. The same is very true in the inpatient realm. And frankly, from what you and I learned at MIT, I think it's true, you know, outside of healthcare, right. And, and, and business as a whole. Yeah, you, you took me back in time to my residency, and, and actually we had this issue in an operating room, and um, unfortunately after the operation, the nurse told me that she knew, but she couldn't say it, because the, the head of department was operating actually, so, you know, going back to this, uh, how, how do you lead these teams' efforts? You talked about uh, creating the safe space. How, how do you do this? How do you ensure there's a safe space? And if I want to challenge a little bit more, I don't know if in your career you had this, did you build the safe space after a leader who before you actually did not have this culture and how you dealt with this? Uh, I think it was, it was a, it was the opposite. I, I was very fortunate in my career as I, as a trainee, as a medical student, as a resident, as a fellow, to even in the research space um, at the NIH, at the Robert Wood Johnson. Um, I think it was, I was very, very fortunate. I was surrounded by mentors who um, created this environment. And so for me, and again, I couldn't describe it, right? I couldn't describe it, you know, when you, when you talk about like um, what we learned at school, right? Uh, with psychological safety and you know some of the work that was done at Harvard in terms of Amy Edmondson it wasn't it wasn't something that I could describe it was just the way that they led and they created this environment where they had high standards they had high standards but it wasn't about getting upset with people or or um getting um mad at people or or or, or demeaning people it was about helping folks setting very high expectations. I think it's, you know, you, you, uh, you and I were talking about this, right? Setting expectations, clearly articulating those expectations. Uh, so folks know where to go and what they need to do, but then giving people the support and then appropriate feedback, right? Um, and then being humble enough to know that it's a team effort. You, somebody has to lead the team, but ultimately you still need the team to work. Um, and, and that humility was something that, um, also translated, 
across many, many of the mentors that I've been fortunate to work with uh, over the years. Can you share one of uh, the stories uh, potentially where things might have gone wrong uh, and how you dealt with this? Uh, I'm really looking at, you know, those mistakes that can be life-threatening actually in your job. And as you're saying, as you're talking about creating this psychological safe environment, how do you deal in mistake, with mistakes in a, in a different uh, sense? You know, it. Uh, that's a great question. I, I Dealing with mistakes, I think, is hard. I think the natural reaction that we all have, or the vast majority of us have, is to ignore the mistake, right? To to put your head in the sand, to 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 just not think about it, right? And when I've worked with um, residents, when I work with medical students, um, younger faculty, um, I try to explain to them that that's been my initial reaction as well. Right there, something happens, and you want to to run away from it or hide it because it it hurts. Right as a as a clinician, as a surgeon, you always want the very best for your patient. And when things don't go right, even if it is something that is within the profile of known complications and things like that, you you take it personally. But one thing I've learned, and it requires work. It actually it requires a tremendous amount of intentional effort is that you have to just confront it, acknowledge it, talk about it with your colleagues, not in a blaming sense, right? You know, of like this person did this or this person did that, because that goes against everything we talked about a minute ago. You'll create an environment that isn't conducive to safety, but to talk about it in terms of how could I have done better? How could we have done better, right? And frame it from that perspective. Um, the, The other thing is, own it, right? So for example, if I have a patient who does have a complication, bring that patient back, talk to them more. Um, you know, don't distance yourself from that patient. Um, and I think this is true whether it's a patient or any problem or any challenge or any mistake, if you will, um, anything like that in life is that distancing yourself from it is, I think, a very natural reaction, but we have to sort of fight that reaction and 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 work through that sort of dissonance in our head and say no let me bring it closer to me and if you do that i think you can learn from those mistakes better and you set an example to your team of okay this is a space where we can talk about it right where where if you make a mistake this is how we're going to handle it and i think that's the other again going back to the idea is how do you model yourself model yourself as a leader folks need to see that right they need if they don't if they see you getting defensive or they see you running away from things, then that's what they're, you know, going to probably do. If they see you owning it and acknowledging it, talking about it, bringing it closer, then they're going to start. And I, again, it goes back to what we started with. I think you'll improve processes and patients care and everything um, dramatically. So much of I, what we do is uh, iterative. I mean, it's, it, it's iterative. I mean, we talk about it in medicine it's the practice of medicine, right? I'm, I, I'll never stop practicing medicine until I stop, right? <laughs> um, I'm always going to be just working to better myself. Um, and I think that's true for life and, and business as well. Oh, totally. And I love it. As you said, do not ignore mistakes, own them. You know, I, you didn't go out and saying, uh, like, kind of sometimes you say it's the other's mistake too and i think this is kind of the worst thing that can happen when you not only disown them but practically say oh it was the operating uh, room schedule or it was the nurse or so so really owning them even if it's not your mistakes but your team's mistake for you to create the safe place and make it better the next time i i love what you shared shirag you also have a key role within your organization now which is business strategy so i was very interested when i read you know for a physician business and strategy uh, in, in their function so i'd love to uh, understand from you how do you define business and also how you define strategy yeah <laughs> so uh it, it's an evolving idea for me actually uh as i'm as i'm getting started this has been something that i'm still learning in myself um the way that I sort of think it's it's hard. You do, healthcare, as you know, right, is is a business, right? Um, so much of we, you know, if it, if if it's not, it goes back to what we talked about in the in our program when it comes to nonprofits, right? A nonprofit still has to run 
like a business, right? It just doesn't have to pay taxes, right? Like a for-profit business does, right? Um, so in healthcare, many of us are in nonprofits. Um, it's still important to run the business and run it well. So the lens through which I'm thinking about this, right, is where what I alluded to a little while ago, which is that I want to understand those best practices that we've studied, right? That even you company, right? Your, your company brings out best practices, right? You use these medications. This is the patient population. This is the best data, et cetera. But the implementation of that has to be done in a large corporate environment, right? Multi-billion dollar health systems have to implement these processes of care. And so for me, that is where I'm sort of thinking about it as how do I help bring management approaches, right? To improve patient care, improve operations um, on multiple levels, right? Whether it's at the individual clinic level or whether it's at the you know departmental level or even at a programmatic, a multidisciplinary programmatic level. In terms of strategy, part of what I'm thinking about is what is the core competency, right? What is the competitive advantage of any health system, right? And, and so I'm just not a big believer in, you know, that there's a fixed pie, right? Uh, one thing you we've learned is that there's there's space in the world for a lot of folks, right? Um, we learn that over and over again with uh, businesses, right? I think about the conversations we had and strategy when it came to like Trader Joe's versus other grocery stores, for example, right? And it seems like a mundane example, but it's no, it's it's very applicable to our life, right? There's room for different health systems in the same market. But I think a lot of times folks get into this idea that it's a zero sum game, right? We're just competing over a fixed number of patients. And I think that there are ways of approaching and guiding programmatic development strategy, right? Around that, whether it's at the departmental level or at an institutional level, that allows the healthcare system to position itself for what it can do the very best, right? Um, and I think that's my approach, at least as I'm thinking about it and as I'm getting started. I love this. And uh, yeah, you reminded me of the fixed buy bias because you talked about it. And it's one of the best biases I learned as a concept in negotiation, right? Like when we all fight for the same buy, who's going to take the bigger piece rather than thinking how to expand actually the buy and we can all benefit from it. So thanks for sharing that. I, I would give you now one word. And I would love your reaction to it. Okay. So the first word is leadership. My reaction to that word is um, understanding your people, understanding who you're leading, and helping them become the best version of themselves within your capacity, right? Um, that to me has always been sort of the way that I approach it. You know, when I interview, People, when I'm thinking about conversations that I've had with people, my first question or one of my early questions is, what what do you aspire for yourself? All right? I want to know that. Um, because if I can help them achieve some of what they aspire, or even better, achieve more than what they believe they can aspire to, right? then I think you can really engage that person and you're really leading them and they'll be with you right through the worst times. Um, but you have to be able to get them there. I, I, I learned this from, I learned this from a, a friend of mine, um, who, who recently passed, um, and, uh, at a young age, uh, she was, uh, one of my, um, early, early mentors as a resident, she was my chief resident and then faculty. Um, and I, you know, leaned on her for advice over the years. Um, uh, her name was uh, uh, Linda Yang, um, and uh, just an outstanding peripheral nerve neurosurgeon. Um, but I saw this with what she did. She would help people, everybody, whether it was somebody in the office who, you know, wanted a nurse in the office who wanted to become a nurse practitioner, but didn't see it in themselves. And she did, and she would push them and then support them. And then suddenly they were like, oh my gosh, look, look what I did um, to, to others who, you know, no, I can't do research. And no, I think you can, right. You can help me with research and you're not a medical student and you're not a resident and you're, you know, et cetera, but you can do research. Let me show you how you can do research. And this is the impact you can make. Um, I think that's, 
when you when you use that word leadership, that's what sort of pops into my head. Oh, thanks, Chirag. And I'm sorry for your loss. And you're touching a key point of mentorship, coaching, uh, which is also part of leadership. What about uh, transformation? Transformation. I think uh, the word transformation, um, the word that comes to my mind and the ideas that come to my mind are around empowerment. Right. I think transformation is an opportunity to to really empower people to move to the next level. Right. Um, to break the status quo. Right. To 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 rebuild, if you will, in a sense. Um, I had a flavor of this, you know, in terms of some programmatic development where we were given the opportunity for transformation. Right. How do you how do you do this? Right. And um the way that it was most successful, the 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 w- opportunities that we leveraged that were the most successful were those opportunities where we empowered people and allowed them to help lead the effort as well, right? And then suddenly that transformation from the ground up was so much more powerful and so much more engaged when it came to the organization. What about health equity? Uh that one, it's a challenging one. I actually, it's it's near and dear to my heart now because I'm seeing um, so much inequity, uh, frankly, in healthcare. Um, for me, it's it's a big challenge that we need to address um, increasingly, not just in the United States but around the world. Um, uh, but living in the United States, I, on some levels, you know, it seems like we've got, as we've talked about many times, wonderful healthcare, which we do have amazing, amazing healthcare. But when you see the inequity, when you see patients who are not able to, who are not able to afford care, right? Um, And, or who, because of social um, uh, determinants of health, right? And the unrecognized aspects that social determinants of health, it's improving, it's getting better, we're understanding it more. But the impact of social determinants of health on health inequity or health equity, I think is another area. So for me, that is an area that actually I'm in very interested in and in trying to understand and explore. And it's one of the things I'd like to understand over the next several years as part of, you know, a research research effort when it comes to neurosurgery and spine surgery is, is exactly that, right? When it comes to the social determinants of health and how that drives inequity in health outcomes. Um, I do think that there's an opportunity to, again, go back to management though, right? How does an organization interact and and interface with other community stakeholders, right? As a way of helping build up capability when it comes to the resources that we can offer the community, the environment, you know, our, the people around it um, to improve health inequity. The last one is spread love in organizations. So <laughs> I um, I think I, I was fortunate to participate in a, um, and I really love your podcast. I love your podcast because you un, unashamedly, I don't even know if, if that's the right word, I think, right? But just right there, you throw it out there, you use the word love, right? And I think... I think that that is an important concept. I was fortunate to participate in um, a physician leadership, or sorry, a healthcare leadership forum um, at Intermountain Healthcare. Um, And it was led by uh, one of the former CEOs of Intermountain Healthcare. His name is Charles Sorensen, wonderful gentleman, wonderful gentleman, very humble, Um, exemplified much of what you and I have talked about this morning. And one of the speakers that he had brought was another executive at um, the uh, Intermountain, former executive at Intermountain Healthcare. And he exact he said that he he emphasized that he's like you know leadership is love as well right as all these other things we've talked about. And that hit home um, when I heard that a few this was a few years ago before the before all this pandemic and everything we've been living through it hit home and and he went through and he described and i thought this was very insightful he went through and he described you know that we don't 
you know, we use the word love, but, you know, you know, if you go back to certain cultures, right, you know, for example, I think you talked about the Greek and the uh, Greek culture and antiquity, right? They had different, they, they put different words around different types of love, right? And that I think is sometimes lost in our modern world that you can love the people around you. And it doesn't have to be all this other stuff. It can truly be a love of mission, a love of watching people grow and become the best versions of themselves. But I think that is an important part that is something that is lost at times, I feel, in the modern era. And I really appreciate what you're trying to do here, which is bring some of that back, you know, into the conversation, right, as a way of um, helping improve business, but also, frankly, improve people's lives, right? Because, you know, work is such an important part of everybody's life. And if you feel good about going to work, right, that's that's a good thing <laughs> when it comes to life in general, right? It shouldn't be consuming, but it should be fun and enjoyable and and uh, and uh, and help you grow as an individual and feel like there's dignity to that, right? That you're coming home. And I think if you don't have love in that conversation, and I think the type of love that we're talking about, right? it it begins to um you lose some of that thank you so much uh Chirac, for saying this it means so much for me and yeah hopefully we're bringing a little bit more of this love you know not the rom romantic love we only think about when we hear the word love but all the other pieces of love of humanity life work and humans any final word of wisdom for healthcare leaders around the world? Uh, you know, it's one thing I've learned. Um, again, I going back to going back to our experience at MIT, Naji, like um I build networks. Um, you know, build networks, build friendships in healthcare, which I think sometimes comes naturally because that's where we are, but build networks of people outside of healthcare, right? In other industries. Um, I you know, I mean, we went through this pandemic together, right? As a as a class, <laughs> um, and and learning from each other. Um, I think it's easy to get siloed, right? In in what we do, but I think learning from each other, um, and finding and seeking out really good people like like yourselves and so many other other folks that we worked with as as classmates, um, is is something I've learned um, has been very valuable, and and actually gives perspective on. The challenges that we're all facing right um and uh the other thing is taking the time to have good conversations um i think uh you know the fireside chats that we had as um as students um were probably some of the most impactful things for me personally um just to learn from each other the humanity that people bring to the table um as well and it gives perspective on on, on our mission. So that that's just uh, just my two cents in addition to obviously everything else we've talked about. Awesome. Thank you so much again uh, for being with me today. Thanks, Naji. It was a pleasure and I look forward to seeing you in person here in uh, next month. Thank you all for listening to Spread Love and Organizations podcast. Subscribe and connect with us on spreadloveio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Most importantly, spread love in your organizations and spread the word around you to inspire others and amplify this movement our world so desperately needs.